thing they're measuring is light. I won't dwell on this point, but architecture measures light because light is everywhere. But um, until you make a surface that reflects it, you don't see, we don't see light unless there's a little mist at the end, right? But normally we don't see light unless it's reflected off of something. And uh, architecture makes reflecting surfaces. And the shapes that those surfaces have, in a sense, shape the light, or they measure the shape of the light. So th this is a house about the measurement of space. In that sense, it's a kind of meta construction. Um, it incorporated uh, a number of things that interested me. Uh, one was the kind of uh, the decay of material things. Um, probably I was attracted as a younger guy to ruins and things like that. I, don't, I never, of course, I grew up in America. We didn't have the same kinds of ruins you have here in Europe. But I was always interested that materials decay. And I wasn't interested in bright, shiny buildings. I was interested in buildings that were somewhere between being whole and uh, disappearing through kind of decay and entropy. So that life is filled with both. You're growing and you're decaying. Now that I'm my age, I can tell you my theory was right. Uh, you know, they happen at the same time. I'm still learning and growing, but I'm also decaying at a rapid rate. Um, so when I, after working on this project, I decided, and I had an opportunity to do a study for Berlin, for the Mitte section of Berlin. This was in 1990, after the wall had come down, and all the people in West Germany, or what was then by then Germany, were saying, well, what do we do at the center of Berlin? Because it had been an East, it had been the, you know, East Germans had neglected it. They didn't have any money uh, to, to really restore buildings or should we build new buildings there? And of course, any, if you go now, 15 years later, to Berlin, you see all of the great new works of architecture that have been built. But I wasn't so much interested, I knew that would happen. That was a foregone conclusion. Germany is a wealthy country. Uh, they want to make a showcase for their uh, prosperity and, and, and so on. It's perfectly natural. But I, want, I, I said, what's well, going to disappear? Because I had been in, in, in the Mitte, in the East, and in places like Kreuzberg before they got totally gentrified. Uh, gentrified. And uh, I said, what's going to be missing are all of those funny spaces, those spaces that are there, maybe not always occupied that people can squat in. You know, you, could, you might have neo-Nazi skinheads or uh, communist uh, youth organization that can't find an official home. So they will occupy these kind of half-abandoned buildings. And, and that's vital to Berlin. That's vital to any city, that there be spaces that aren't designated, that don't have a label on the door. And, and so I said, let, what if we I just float in some of these solo house, kind of ambiguous structures into the city of Berlin, into the center. So uh, just as part of my narrative to work on it myself, I literally had these things floating in, like alien objects, something uh, totally uh, out of the so-called culture, certainly out of any official culture of, of Berlin or Germany. And what these structures would do is plant themselves in the buildings. So you have, you know, the kind of Cartesian cubic space of most architecture, certainly in the uh, center of Berlin. And then introduced into it are these kind of spaces that had three qualities, very important, three qualities. One of them was um, that they have no meaning, predetermined. They're meaningless. They have no purpose, okay, predetermined. They don't have a function. And the third is that they're difficult to occupy. This is really maybe the most important one. So you can't comfortably go in them and resume your usual habits. Because you can't even stand up on the floors, you know. 
And um, you have to figure out how to be in the space. You have to invent. And I call these free spaces. Free in the sense that they were free of those things. They were free of meaning and free of purpose. Certainly free of comfort. <laughs> so you couldn't bring your own old furniture in, so to speak. You had to invent uh, the way to be in them. And of course, the underlying premise of my idea was, well, that's the way all space should be. We should approach every space um, as potentially a free space, but we have to invent how to be in it and not follow the typological model given to us by all the people around us, by all the institutions that commission and build buildings, build spaces. Uh, we should just invent who we are and what we do in those spaces. So the free space uh, made its first appearance in Berlin. And um, yeah, this is a view into one of those uh, kind of scary looking uh, spaces in the sense that you know, there's no windows, and they don't look particularly friendly, and you're not sure how to move in them. I mean, by now, at my age, I'd have a hell of a time getting around, but um, I, don't, I don't have to worry about it because none of them were ever built. Uh, but nevertheless, could have been. But in, the, in this view, you see a white box. And the white box, to make a long story short, is kind of the opposite of the black box, which is a surveillance device. It, we all know black box is a term for some surveillance device. And a white box is, is a device for connecting. You know, it's not for spying. It's for connecting through electronics. Believe me, in 1990, we didn't have the internet or this kind of machine to, to use. Um, computers were still big, heavy things that corporations had. Maybe there were some PCs, but not so many. Uh, but anyway, it was the white box of technology that could, we could communicate with, communicate anywhere, you know, which is what we can do with our technological uh, uh, instruments. Um, so there's a little blanket there and a place to rest and, and so on. Um, this is a kind of diagram. On the left you see this figure, and again, these are so blurry, I apologize. It's not my fault. If you can see what I'm seeing on the screen, it's a lot more vivid. Um, but there's a figure sitting at one of these white boxes, kind of looking into it. And what we see projected from that is going through this kind of abstract electronic world, which is the world of quantum mechanics and, and, and uh, you know, speed of light, um, microchips and the like. But what emerges out of all that is a kind of rich soup of, of stuff, words, lines, spaces, uh, that you know, come through this technology. So in a way, you're able to unleash a kind of chaos uh, if you want to. The plan, uh, the Berlin plan, the plan of the center, those of you who know Berlin recognize well, you could, this is the old map, which shows the wall, you see. This is the line of the wall. This is the Brandenburg Gate, Pariser Platz. This is the uh, Reichstag. And this is the so-called bourgeois section, the grid, pretty part of the center, into Den Linden, and so on. So this was the area in which these free spaces would appear as the, you know, indicated the plan as these black shapes embedded in these buildings. Secret, of course, um, it'd be hard to keep them secret, but the idea was that was the direction to go, even if it, you didn't succeed in maintaining it. It's a kind of secret community of spaces. 